Here's what I see when I'm in, in my academic practices. Sometimes people do laterals and they do the posterior percutaneous fixation and they're not paying attention to the sagittal balance. And that's a very big problem because then what you end up doing is fusing people into a flat back. The concepts of when to utilize these kinds of techniques and when not to is very important. Um, and I'm not sure that a lot of people get that just yet. So um, there's been some work through this, this uh, International Spine Study Group, the MIS arm, to try to look at some of these kinds of issues uh, to try to give us some guidance and maybe an algorithm on how to select patients appropriately for when to consider minimally invasive surgery. You saw my disclosures earlier. Basically, the issues are this. Here, this is the reason why we would think about doing uh, less surgery for adult spinal deformity. Uh, Justin showed you some pictures of uh, open deformity surgery in his practice. I find that curious since he was a Fessler fellow, how that ended up being that big and wide open, but it is what it is. And, uh, and the pseudoarthrosis rates can be problematic. Complication rates are high. This has been reported in a number of different articles. This is our article from some six years ago looking at uh, some of the uh, cases that we did with open PSO. And here's all the complications that we found in the literature, uh, as well as some of the things that we've experienced, durotomies, coagulopathies, uh, cardiac issues, neurological deficits, infections, altered mental status from being under anesthesia for so long, urinary tract infections, hematomas, DVT, PE, MI, et cetera, et cetera. And um, so there's a number of things where we could potentially have an impact on complications. And uh, Schwab looked at a, uh, an in an article in European Spine Journal, risk factors for these ma major perioperative complications. I think Justin and I were both co-authors on this, but basically what ended up happening is, well, here's the issues that were found not to have a significant impact on complications. The demographics of the patient, their vital signs, their ASA score, their cardiac disease, uh, common, common comorbidities, these were not the major issues that correlated with the complications. What was the major issue that correlated with complications was the number of stages of surgery you had and the type of surgical approach you had. So these are surgeon controlled parameters. They are not patient reliant parameters uh, and so it's more procedure related than patient related, these kinds of complications. So um, what I can tell you is that if we're not having too much problem with the BMI, the age, the sex, and the ASA score, and those do have a role, but they didn't have as major a role as the procedure-related risks, the number of stages of surgery, and what kind of surgery that you did. So for these kinds of reasons, people started trying to do some of this stuff, MIS, uh, to try to control these surgeon control parameters. And in degenerative spine disease, what happens is there is a measurable impact if you do it MIS versus if you do it open. So uh, in degenerative disease for single level surgery, the hospital stay, the EBL, those are pretty much lower in MIS cases for TLIF, for example. Um, most of the patients who are candidates for an open TLIF and for an MIS TLIF are pretty much the same patients. The issue is, does this hold true for MIS and open deformity surgery? And the answer is no. Um, patients who you can treat with open deformity surgery sometimes cannot be treated with MIS deformity surgery. I think it's a key take home message. There are some people who shouldn't have this kind of MIS type stuff if they have certain parameters. And if you do it for them, you're gonna probably predict failure in reoperation. So just looking at the DGEN literature, and uh, Jason Chang was one of our residents who last year helped me look at some of our MIS TLIFs at UCSF, and what we found was length of stay is shorter. Because the length of stay is shorter, the, the overall global cost of hospitalization is smaller compared to open TLIFs, and the long-term outcomes are similar, and they had less EBL, less transfusions. So does this hold true for MIS? And here's all the questions you have to ask yourself. Can you decompress these patients? Uh, can you place hardware? Can you correct sagittal balance? Will you match the LLPI within 10 degrees? And this is not, a, a, these two questions are not asked by a lot of people who do these MIS surgeries. Is it gonna take a long time to do and are you gonna get a pseudoarthrosis? This is a problem that I've had, where if I didn't do an inner body at every level, I ended up getting pseudos. Because you have an incision that's really small, you got just about this much view of the facet joint, trying to pack some bone in there and a 65 year old is not reliably getting a fusion. So in 2010 was probably the first time that you saw a number of publications on this kind of topic. And it was a neurosurgery focus um, in 2010 where a number of MIS articles and Neil Anand had one. And if you look at his article, here's the problems that he had at that time. He had dysesthesias from the lateral approach. He had quadriceps palsy from the lateral approach. Uh, from the lateral approach, a, hem a hematoma near the kidney uh, from moving the kidney around. 
Uh, there was one remote hemorrhage in the brain, screw prominence, screw fractures, a number of issues with doing these kinds of cases, MIS. And uh, this is the article from Tormenti, and uh, these, uh, these guys, is, uh, with, uh, he's with Adam Cantor and, and uh, David Aconqua at UPIT, and they do a lot of lateral approaches in patients who have deformity. And what happens when you have deformity is not only are your, is your spine rotated around, but your abdominal contents are rotated around too. So as the spine gets rotated, the bowel gets rotated. As the spine gets rotated, the iliac vessels are rotated. So you come in on your routine lateral approach, and I know there's a lateral talk here by Sanser later today, I think, but uh, as you come in on your routine lateral approach, structures that you don't expect to be in the way of your surgery are suddenly in the way of your surgery. And so this is how they ended up with a bowel perforation. Uh, didn't even know about it during the case and figured it out later when the patient became quite ill. So we have to watch for how are these abdominal structures gonna be rotated in the field um, because the normal anatomy is no longer normal in a deformity case with a lot of rotation. This is an article from Uribe's group in Tampa and basically what they saw is that they were very good at correcting the coronal curve they were not good at correcting the sagittal plane. So this is not the curve that you want to focus on. What you want to focus on is the SVA that I talked to you about this morning, trying to get that back to normal, matching the LL to the PI. Because of those, in those times, people who did a lot of this kind of surgery didn't understand that, what they ended up doing is one third of the patients in their series did not have sagittal balance restored. So the coronal correction is not that important as the sagittal correction. So we've got to keep these things in mind not everybody who has one of these coronal curves is a good candidate to have it fixed through a lateral approach with posterior percutaneous fixation. Another thing that happened in this kind of a case is over time, uh, some of these screws fracture. Um, and it depends on how well you're going to get a fusion. If you don't get a fusion, the hardware is going to give. Uh, Mike Wang and I looked at our series of about two dozen patients back then in 2010. And we had a very high pseudo rate every time we did not do an inner body fusion and we did posterior percutaneous fixation. So this business of trying to put a tube down in a 70-year-old, rough up the facet, pack some iliac autograft in the facet, didn't work out for us real well. We had a number of patients who had pseudos and loosened screws. And so we needed to figure out, is there an algorithm of when you should consider doing these kinds of surgeries for deformity patients? And so we came up with this, and it was just published actually this month in Neurosurge Focus. Uh, and there's a number of articles in this month's Neurosurge Focus from some very um, well-established deformity groups uh, and I would, I would urge you to look at it. It's free online. Of course, you can pull it up pretty much here in the room if you want. This is one of the articles of when to do uh, MIS deformity surgery. So basically, if you have an SVA of less than six centimeters and you have a pelvic tilt of less than 25, you have essentially a moderate deformity. And even if your SVA is more than six centimeters, they lie down, it corrects nicely, and you have a flexible curve. Again, with the pelvic tilt of less than 25, again, a moderate deformity. If you have such a mild deformity that you don't have any LLPI mismatch, you don't have any lateral slippage, you don't have a big coronal cob angle, you certainly could decompress that patient through a tube, not even have to put any hardware in a lot of cases, or if they have a bit of a listhesis, you could do a single level fusion. So you could do fairly small surgery with a low SVA, a normal pelvic tilt, a really, really good LLPI match, uh, no listhesis, no coronal cob problem, Small surgery, maybe even without hardware, be just fine. What about if they have a pelvic tilt to 20, less than 25, but they have LLPI mismatch up to 30 degrees? Um, and if they have that problem, you can basically end up doing what you see a lot of being done nowadays, lateral approaches with percutaneous screw fixation. However, they have a very high SVA, a very rigid curve with a massively big pelvic tilt of like 30 degrees and an LLPI mismatch of 40 and 50 degrees with the thoracic hyperkyphosis. These are cases that are going to predict failure if you do them with MIS. You're not going to be able to achieve those kinds of parameters. Um, those cases should be done open in the way that Justin was showing pictures because you're just not going to get from here to there, especially if they got old, hard old hardware in there and you have to go dig it out. These are the ones basically that we need to focus on for the majority of patients who are candidates for this kind of surgery. The apex of the lumbar curve is gonna be included in the instrumentation. The LLPI mismatch is somewhere between 10 and 30 degrees. They may have a grade one or two listhesis, either lateral or anterior listhesis. Their pelvic tilt is relatively small at less than 25. They have a coronal cob angle of more than 20. 
These folks do pretty well if you do a lateral and a percutaneous fixation. This is the group that we need to focus on. These are the kinds of cases that will be done well using this kind of, of an approach because there's a ceiling effect or a limit to how much you can get away with with MIS. And Mike Wang had a very nice paper, and again, this month's Neurosurge Focus, where he looked at what is a ceiling effect? How much can I do and where can I stop? And basically found those parameters I just talked to you about to be the limits. Uh, that if you start having really bad SVA, high SVA of like seven centimeters, eight centimeters, and you have an LLPI mismatch more than 30, then those cases were not getting done real well with MIS. So don't try to do those with MIS. So this is the kind of case you don't want to do with MIS. It's a patient who has a, um, a lateral listhesis and an anterior listhesis, I didn't show you the coronal here, but has already got hardware in here, PJK over the top, we're not going to be able to get this SVA corrected MIS and get this hardware out, MIS. We're going to have to open this case, and we ended up doing a VCR for this patient. Um, but these are the kinds of cases that predict failure with MIS. Can you do iliac fixation MIS? Yeah, you can put in all your lumbar pedicle screws. You can put in your iliac fixation. You can do all of it MIS if you want to. Um, what cases need to have iliac fixation? What are the characteristics of your operative plan that are going to tell you that you need to have iliac fixation. Let's have a volunteer. Indications for iliac fixation. All right, how many of you at your home institution do iliac fixation? Okay, when do you do it? You got a person in the back, way back there. Long being longer than what to S1? Into the lower thoracic, okay. I would say L2 or more to S1, okay, that's one. What other, what, that's one good reason why you should do iliac fixation. What's another? Yes, you have pseudoarthrosis, loosened S1 screws, absolutely. What is the purpose of the iliac fixation? So you want to get your L5-S1 to heal without loosening your S1 screws. Is the SI joint going to fuse if you put an iliac fixation? What happens two years after you put in an iliac screw to that iliac screw? Is that going to be a good solid fixation in two years from now? No, it's not because you're not fusing across the SI joint. We don't put bone graft across. That joint is massive. It's really big. Um, so what ends up happening two years after your iliac fixation is if you go back and you do a CT scan or an x-ray, a lot of times you can see haloing and loosening around that iliac screw. That iliac screw is there as a temporary stabilizer. It's there to temporarily stabilize your S1 screws, give some structural rigidity so you can achieve a solid L5 S1 fusion. That's the purpose of it. And when do you need it? Constructs bigger than L2 to S1 is the primary time you need it cases where you don't have good S1 fixation, high-grade listhesis cases, uh, cases where you can't even grab the sacrum because it's destroyed or fractured. Those are the primary reasons why you need to do iliac fixation. So it's important to keep in mind the indications before you just do the surgery. So I think a lot of what happens that I see our residents doing and sometimes people come to the course is they're so fixated on the techniques that they're not thinking about the indications for the techniques. So you've got to take a step back and think, when do I need this? I have an armamentarium. It doesn't apply to all the patients. So just because you have a hammer doesn't mean you're going to want to hit every nail with it. So some nails don't need a hammer. And so you've got to figure out when to do it. But you can do iliac fixation in two different ways now. Most commonly is done is you put a, a sacral, excuse me, an iliac screw, or you can put an S2AI screw. And these are the different trajectories for each. And you can place both of these MIS. And so an iliac screw typically from the PSIS is one centimeter superior and a centimeter deep to the PSIS. And then it has that trajectory here in the blue. And basically, we'll go over the greater sciatic notch. Now, what happens if you penetrate the greater sciatic notch? What are you going to hit? It's a mumbling, but someone speak up a little bit louder. Sciatic nerve, OK. What else are you going to hit? That's right, superior gluteal artery. And if you hit that, what ends up happening is that vessel, if you cut it, will retract up into the pelvis and keep bleeding. So uh, Zia, I think, had, a, had a, a case where he had to have IR go and embolize that vessel because he couldn't get it. So we don't want to be in the notch. We want to get this thick bone right above the notch. So you want to get close but not in. So this, again, is the entry point for the S2AI screw. That's going to cross the SI joint, and it's going to end up going over the greater sciatic notch. But, but those are the issues that you've got to think about. You can do it MIS as well. So one thing that I see at our place is that people don't like to push the gear shift. So they take a mallet and they start hitting it. You, do, you lose all your feel if you use the mallet. But some people have thick pelvis, and that's what you end up having to do. But you got to be careful. Uh, an AP view is also a nice way to make sure that you miss it. 
So uh, this is placing at MIS. Um, basically, if you think about doing it MIS, and you look at a pedicle MIS, a pedicle, if you do an end-on shot, looks like a circle, and this looks like an oval. And so long as you're within the oval, you can put your jam sheety there with the operator outlet view, and you can do this MIS as well. And uh, Mike and I published a paper of looking at that in a couple dozen patients. And I'll show you a video, basically, of doing this kind of surgery in someone who qualifies for it. So it's a 64-year-old with back pain, leg pain. Here's his preoperative imaging. He's got bad stenosis, multiple levels. You can see he's got a relatively flat back. We measured his coronal Cobb angle at 22 degrees. His SVA is a little bit high at eight centimeters. He's a bit of a thin guy, though. His lumbar lordosis is 28. His pelvic incidence is 68. So he needs about 30, 40 degrees of correction. So this is a bit more than you can get with the average uh, uh, MIS surgery by itself. So I did ended up starting with an ALIF with some hyperlordotic grafts in the front. And then I put him prone and I did the posterior part with uh, T-lifts. I uh, wanted to get an inner body as, at every level if I could because when I don't get an inner body at every level I was having pseudoarthrosis. So basically I make a skin incision here. I leave all the fascia intact. And it is an option of course to make multiple stab incisions. You could do that too and it looks like a train tracks ran up and down somebody's back. but. If I have a single midline skin and I leave the fascia intact, it usually to me is easier to deal with. So now I'm going to be uh, dilating to uh, put down my tubular retractor to do the T-lifts. So uh, we dilate the paraspinal muscle. Um, the spinous processes are here. Uh, this is sacrum down here, and this is going to be L1 area up here. So uh, putting the... Um, uh, the uh, expandable tubular retractor there. What I'm basically doing is docking this on the facet joint. How many of you do MIS T-lifts at your institution? You know, I, I'm interested to see that uh, lateral approaches are being done more than MIS T-lifts in a lot of institutions. From what I can see of your audience polling, interesting to me, since MIS T-lift has been around for a bit longer. Um, so I'm getting the muscle off the facet joint. I put down the tubular retractor. So as you can see, there's not a lot of bleeding going on here. And then by expanding it a little bit, now I have access to do my decompression through the tube and I have access to do my T-lift through the tube. So I chose which side to do the T-lift based on where the foraminal stenosis was. So um, at this level, the foraminal stenosis was more on the right. Uh, you'll see I'll put another tube in on the left. This, because of the level above the foraminal stenosis is more on the left. So um, we were able to do simultaneous T-lifts, the fellow and I, and this is John was my fellow that year. Uh, here we're taking off the facet joint, or I'm taking off the facet joint. John's about to take off his facet joint. He likes to use a drill. So I save all the local autograft. Um, people ask me sometimes, where do I get my bone graft? I don't make a separate incision on the pelvis. Through this midline skin incision, if I take an Army Navy and I lift up, the iliac crest is right there and I can harvest a whole bunch of it. And so I usually do that. So here's the A-lifts from before. This is the T-lift here. I take a lot of time to make sure I get that disc out and I scrape those end plates. Um, because you can do a T-lift and take out like a third of the disc and squeeze the cage in and get a pseudo. Or you can take your time and get all the disc out and then make sure you get it full of bone and have a much higher chance of effusion. And so for me, I don't want to have a pseudo. So this is why I ended up doing that. Now, I've already um, cannulated screws looking through the tube and putting in pedicle markers. You saw that there. Um, I don't um, put the screws in while I'm doing the T-lift because the head's getting in the way. And this is a little bone funnel. And you'll just see how much bone I start putting down this funnel to get into the T-lift. And so I pack that funnel full of crest. You see John doing the same thing. He's getting the disc space shaver in there, and he's going to clean out that disc. Now I put in my cage, and my cage is full of bone graft. Meanwhile, the other side's pretty much ready to go now, too. So here we have the T-lift here. We're doing a T-lift in here, too. Here's a cage going in on the other side.
And again, this is for a class two type deformity in that algorithm I was showing you. Now we're going to do some pedicle screw fixation. This guy had hard bone and the uh, little awl was bouncing off of it, so I do use a little drill. And I have a cannulated gear shift. You could just do it with a, uh, with a jam sheeting needle and putting a K-wire down the jam sheeting needle if you want to. That's another way of doing it. All kinds of variations on this theme. But so here I have a cannulated gear shift and I put my K-wire down the center of it. Here you see all these uh, percutaneous screws on that side through the fascia. There's a couple over here. Now I can tap over it and put the, um, put the screw down over the top. Notice, again, not a lot of bleeding going on here. What's the number one issue of this is like it, how much fluoro you get and how much time you take. And as you get better at it, you figure out ways, like with the cannulated gear shift, to use less fluoro. So you don't uh, get cataracts later. There's a certain number of shots of fluoro you're going to take before you get a cataract. So this is tapping over the K-wire. Notice that I bounce the K-wire up and down. Why? Because if you tap and you don't have the K-wire bouncing up and down, you can grab the K-wire and push it out the front. What lives there? The iliac. So that makes for a bad day. Mike Wang had a case report where he um, didn't have the K-wire and the tap perfectly coaxial. And so the K-wire is at an angle to the, uh, to the tap. And as he tapped, it sheared off the tip of the K-wire and left it in the vertebral body. So all kinds of things can happen if you don't pay attention. So you've got to pay attention by bouncing it up and down. I call that the K-wire dance. I make sure that the K-wire is not getting bound up and it's not going to get sheared off. And then putting the screw in over the wire. So uh, now that the hardware is in, um, take basically a lordotic rod and we can put it in there. And uh, we can, by doing uh, a rod placement and derotation, and then uh, I use these extended tab screws, but basically you can dial the screws down and it will correct the spine to the rod. So put the lordotic rod in. That's also something that with a little practice gets much quicker. A lot of it was, because I had two A-lifts and those two T-lifts. But the rod did get some. The rod gets me the D-rotation. Then we put in our set screws and essentially do the correction. So you basically get the idea there. I'm not going to take up all your time with the video, but uh, I think the takeaway points here is that PI is a fixed parameter. The pelvic tilt is a temporary compensating mechanism. You must have the same goal, whether you do it open or MIS. If you're not going to achieve this, don't do it MIS. You've got to be in that class two of deformity. You want to match that PI within 10 degrees of lumbar lordosis and get your SVA corrected within five centimeters. So I think this is helpful for class one and two mild to moderate deformities to do it MIS. You must restore sagittal balance. It's not great for cases that currently need a three-column osteotomy to really get the correction. Thanks very much.